to use all the methods that, methods that you know in one variable case. A general function is not going to be like this, right? For example, this one is not like this. So, so I cannot directly use, I cannot directly use L'Hopital's rule for two variables, and there isn't any obvious way to use it because there is more than one possible derivative. Okay? So which actually brings, brings, uh, brings up the question as to what are possible derivatives for functions in two variables. And that's our next subject. So I have already kind of alluded to, to the answer. Because there are two variables, we can actually uh, differentiate with respect to either one of them, and we get a meaningful derivative. And these are called partial derivatives. Partial derivatives. So what are, what are partial derivatives? So we have a function, let's say we have a function f of x, y in two variables. And uh, when we talk about derivatives, it, we should, first of all, we should fix the point. Uh, we should fix the point at which we're taking the derivative, right? Because for a different point, you'll have different derivatives. The same thing happens, um, same thing happens uh, in a, for functions in one variable. So let's say we have a point which has coordinates a and b. What we can do is we can convert this function into a function in one variable but by freezing one of the variables. Freeze one of the variables. So for example, we can say y is equal to b. Freeze, freeze the second variable and say that y, variable y is equal to b, which is that the second coordinate of this point. So what, what we get then is a f of x uh, and b. And let me indicate the fact that I would have frozen, would have frozen this by red. So red would be a, a fixed value. So here also would be, we'll put them in red. We indicate that these are numbers like 1 or 5 or, or 27 over 11, whatever you want, right? But x is a variable, so x could plug in any number you want and you'll get an answer. So you want to view it still as a function, but because you have frozen one of the two variables, there's only one variable that's remaining. Therefore, what you get is a function in one variable only. Function in one variable. And once we get a function in one variable, we can then differentiate it. Just in the usual way, how we differentiate functions in one variable. Differentiate it. So we'll get, say, g prime, and then we can substitute the, the value that we wanted, the value a. So then finally we get a number. So in other words, we have a function in two variables. First we freeze one of the two variables, and then we take the derivative with respect to the second variable at the particular value of that variable, namely a. So the result of this is what's called the first, the first partial derivative, or partial derivative with respect to x. Partial derivative with respect to x. At this point, at the point a, b. And the notation for this is f sub s of a. Likewise, I could freeze the second uh, variable, I mean, uh, well, the first variable, x. I could say x is equal to a. Then I, I get a function again in one variable, where the first variable is, is frozen, but the second one is free. So I get a function in one variable, it's called h. And then I can differentiate it. So what I get is this h prime of b. And that's called the partial derivative, the partial derivative with respect to why? For which notation, I'm just, I'm just abbreviating the same sentence as I have at the top of this board. The notation for this is obviously f sub y, right here, f sub y of AB. So, so we, got, we got two derivatives for functions in two variables, the first and the second. Now, so let's, let's, let's look at an example of what this looks like. Let's say f of x, y is x to the 5 plus x times y cubed plus cosine x times e to the y. And we would like to find the partial derivatives. Now, when I defined them, when I defined them, I was insisting that the value of, um, that, that the derivative has to be evaluated for particular values of a and b. Or, sorry, particular values of x and y, which I denoted by a and b. Just like in the case of a function one variable, let's say if you have a function, let's say for function, function one variable, say f of x is equal to x cubed. I could say that f prime for, for any value a will be, eight, uh, well, will be 3a, 3a squared, right? That's the rule, because I know the rule. The rule is that uh, the derivative of x cubed is 3 times x squared. And then if I substitute x equals a, then I get this. So usually we don't write it like this. Usually we just write f prime of x is x squared. In other words, we would like to look at not just one value of the derivative for a particular value of, of x, namely a, but for all, at all of them. For all possible values of x, we would like to know what the value of the derivative is. And then we can substitute, substitute x equals a, for example, one half. Then you will get, oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot 3, 3 squared. <laughs> and no one corrected me, or at least I, I didn't get. 3a squared, of course, for the function. And we substitute x equals a, and we get 3a squared. But it's too, it's too pedantic to go this long way each time and say, well, what, if I ask what is the derivative of this function, you say, well, for a given value a, the derivative at, at the point a is going to be 3a squared. Instead, you just write the prime of x is 3a squared. And that, what is understood is that if I want the value at a particular, for a particular a, I'll just plug a into this formula, and I'll get the answer. Right? So we will use the same shorthand for partial derivatives. In other words, we'll not be, I will not be writing each time that fx of ab, I will just write, I will just write fx of xy. You know, I'll just write, or just fx sometimes. And that will be a function of x and y, so that if I substitute a instead of x, b instead of y, I will get the value of the derivative of this particular partial derivative at that point. So let's see how it works in this, in this case. In, in fact, nothing could be uh, easier. You just look at this function. In order, to, in order to calculate the partial derivative with respect to x, you just view 
view y as a parameter, but not a variable. Not a variable. Not a variable. This is exactly what I meant when I said that we freeze the, the value, freeze uh, y. It just means that we view y as a, as a parameter. Okay. And, and then you just differentiate what, differentiate what we see. Well, what do you see? You see x to the 5. So you get 5x to the 4th plus differentiate this to y cubed plus differentiate this. You get negative sine x times e to the y. And that's it. That's the answer. That's the, answer. That's the way you write the answer. Now, if you, want, if you are given some x and y, some values for x and y, like a and b, you can substitute them and you'll get a number. But in fact, you can view this first partial derivative with respect to x as a function of x and y, which is just obtained in this way. Likewise, we, we view x as a parameter. And then take the derivative with respect to y. So if x is a parameter, then from this point of view, this is just a constant. Right? It's independent of y. Therefore, its derivative is 0. Right? So it's going to be 0 plus, here it's also a parameter. So we just differentiate y cubed. So we get 3x y squared. Cosine x is also constant. And the derivative for e to the y is e to the y. So that's the answer for the, for the second partial derivative. Is that clear? Yeah, so this is really straightforward. You only need to know how to differentiate functions in one variable, really. Yes? Why doesn't cosine go away? In which one? In this one? Well, let's, let's suppose instead of this, you had 5 times, five times e to the y. Then the derivative would still be 5 e to the y, right? Or any other constant would just show up as a scale as overall factor. So in the event, the scalar, the constant is cosine x. Right? That's what I mean when I say we treat x as a parameter. If we treat x as a parameter, it's treated as a number. And so any expression involving x, like cosine x, is a fixed number. So it just shows up as an extra factor. Any other questions? OK. So next, I would like to explain the geometric meaning of this. Because as you, as you see in this, in this course, algebra and geometry go hand in hand. And all, of this, all, the, all the concepts that we discuss algebraically, they have geometric interpretation, which is very important. So for functions in one variable, the derivative of the function has to do with the slope right, of the tangent line. In one variable. Derivative gives a slope of the tangent line to the graph. And so the way we draw it is like this. We have a we have a we have xy plane, we have a function f of x, we have y equals f of x as a graph. Note again that y here has a totally different meaning than y in here. Y in here is, is a second variable. So it's uh, on equal footing with x. x and y are two independent variables. But now I'm talking about functions in one variable. So there's only one variable, x. And y is not a variable. It's actually, it denotes the value of a function. I already talked about this. It's an unfortunate choice of notation, but that's how it is. So I'm not going to change it. So we pick a point, let's say x equals a, and uh, we draw a tangent line. We draw a tangent line, and we know that the derivative, let's say the angle is theta, that the tangent of theta is the derivative f prime of a. That's the geometric meaning of the derivative of functions in one variable. So then it's natural to ask what is the meaning uh, for functions uh, in two variables. To understand that, we have to look at the graph of the function in two variables. What does that look like? Well, for a function in one variable, a graph is a curve on the plane. And I, I will talk about it many times. Why, why do you need a plane? Because to, to represent the graph, you have to, to have your variables, and you have to throw in one additional variable, which will represent the value of the function. For a function in two variables, there are already two variables to begin with. And with, to draw a graph, we have to throw in one more, one more variable, which will represent uh, the value of the function. So as a result, a graph of a function in two variables is going to live in three-dimensional space. So it will have coordinates x, y, and z. It will have coordinates x, y, and z. And we will have a graph uh, of this function, which will be a surface. So I would like to just draw, to just draw part of it, which lives in the, in the first um, octant uh, on the plane. The coordinate system breaks, breaks the plane into four quad quadrants, four coordinates, which are called quadrants, right? Because there are four of them. In space, the coordinate planes, coordinate plane break the entire three-dimensional space into eight pieces, which are called octants. So th this is one octant. This, it's, it's looking at us. Like this, and so the graph actually lives everywhere. But I have just drawn the intersection of the graph with each of the um, each of the coordinate planes. And so you should think of this as, as something like a, like a dome, like a sphere, like part of a sphere. It's not necessarily a sphere. I'm just uh, just like this is not a circle. I mean, I'm just, I'm just drawing a simple a simple graph. And to to, to emphasize this, I want to I want to show a particular point on, on this. So let's say I take this point. And so this point has coordinates. To find the coordinates, I have to drop perpendicular on the x-y plane. And so that's going to look like this, right? And then that's the, that's the z coordinate, maybe a little, a little higher. A little bit higher. Right here. So this point is, what is this point? So this point has coordinates a and b. And the third coordinate is the value of the function. Because it, 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 it lives on this yellow, on this yellow surface. I don't, I don't want to shade it, because otherwise it, 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 it will not be clear what am I shading. Am I shading this? Am I shading the plane? And so, on. so I'm just trying to, just try to imagine that there is something here, which looks like a part of a sphere. And that's, that's the point which it belongs to it. And that's the graph of a function, f of xy. So it's, a, it's defined by the equation z equals f of xy. Okay? And this is a particular point, let's call it p, which has coordinates a, b. These are given. These are given. These are just the values of x and y. And what about the z coordinate? Well, since it's a graph, the z coordinate has to be f of, of, of the x and y coordinates. So that means that I have f of ab in here. If you want to, to be consistent, I should put it in red. So that's what this point is. So this is, this is f of ab. Is it clear so far? OK. So now, what, what, what is the slope? What is the slope of the graph? Well, first of all, it's not really the slope of, of the graph. It's the slope of the tangent line. So here, actually, 
it doesn't make sense to talk about the tangent, tangent line to the graph because the line is one dimensional and the graph is two dimensional. How can it be? How can, can it not be two dimensional if we have function two variables? Function one variables will have a graph which is a curve, but function two variables has a graph which is a surface, so it's two dimensional. So it doesn't make sense to talk about a tangent line unless we make some choices, uh, give some additional information. So in fact, the proper notion here is a tangent plane, and this is something we'll talk about on Thursday. Okay. So that's really ultimately what we would like to understand is the analog of this picture in two dimensions, and the full to get the full analog of this picture, we should really talk about the tangent plane. Okay. But for now, I have a more limited goal. I want to illustrate the concept of partial derivatives. And when I talk about partial derivatives, I said that I freeze one of the two variables. And then I basically go back to the one-dimensional case, to the case of function one variable. So that's what I would like to do. I don't want to talk immediately about the tangent plane, the entire tangent plane. I want to see what I get when I freeze one of the variables. So in my algebraic calculation on that board, I first froze uh, the second variable y. So what happens if I freeze y? If I freeze y, it means that I look at the part of the graph which has a fixed y-coordinate, namely b. So it means that I cut this graph, I cut this graph with a plane which is y equals b. So the result is going to look something like this. So the blue, this blue, is the intersection with the plane y equals b. That's what I get. Okay. So now, instead of a instead of a surface, I get a curve. This intersection is actually a curve because now y is frozen. Y is equal to b, and so it's out of the game. So the game now is between s and z, and it's the same game. It's a game, same game as a game for functions in one variable, right? So in fact. I can draw. I can draw this curve as a as a graph for the function in one variable x, which I get by substituting uh, y equals b. This is, by the way, the function which I called g of s on that board. So let me draw this. So now, as I said, I only have x and z variables remaining, and um, this blue uh, curve is going to look like going to look like this. And of course, it continues somewhere, but since I didn't draw it on the big picture, I'm not going to draw it much beyond beyond the first quadrant. Um, it will be tempting to do it here. I know you might be wondering why am I doing like this and not like this. But the point is you have to look at it not from this angle, but from, from the back of the blackboard, where x and z become the oriented coordinate system. You see what I mean? You have to turn this. You have to turn this coordinate system like this, 90 degrees in this way, so, so that to make the x to go to the right and z go, go um, um, uh, vertically up, go, go up, right? If, you, if I look like this, it will be x will go here. So I don't want this. Right? I, want to look, I want to look like this. And that's what I will see. If I turn it, this is, this is what I will see. So this is, in fact, a graph. This is a graph of what I call g of x, which is obtained by taking f of x, b. It is part of the surface, which is a graph of the entire function, but I have frozen one of the variables, so I actually was able to reduce my problem to the problem of function one variable. I get a, a graph of function one variable, this is namely z equals g of x. And now I, calculate, I can calculate for the value of x equal to a, I can calculate the slope of the tangent line. Right? So let me draw this tangent line in white. So there is a tangent line, and it has a slope. And the tangent of the slope is the derivative g prime at point a, which is what we call the first partial derivative of the function f at the point a, b. You see what I mean? I have, I'm doing geometrically here precisely what I did algebraically on this board. Algebraically, I freeze one of the variables, I get function one variable called g of x, and I differentiate it at x equals a. And now I'm doing the same geometrically. Freezing the second variable means intersecting the graph with the plane y equals b. Then I'm down to two variables. I can look at it as a graph of function one variable, and then I look at the tangent line to this graph at this point, and I measure the, the slope of the tangent line. The, 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 the slope is, is that derivative which we were looking for, namely the partial derivative with respect to x. Any questions? Okay. So let me draw it now on this board. So this tangent line that I drew over there is going to look like this, right? That's this tangent line. It's not the entire tangent plane. It's, it's, it's one line on that tangent plane. If you think of the tangent plane as this. It doesn't want to turn anymore. Okay. I didn't know that it had uh, some knobs and some, some things to play with. Um, if this is a tangent plane, then I could draw just one line on it. And that's a line of intersection with the xy plane. Maybe it's better like this. To draw. If you think of the, uh, not the xy plane, sorry, it's, really, it's, it's a plane y equals b. If you think of the y equals b plane as this vertical kind of vertical plane, then that's the tangent line that I got. So this green plane is not, is not yet on the picture. I have not drawn it yet. I have only drawn this. And so now I'm going to draw the second one. So that's my point. That, that's my point, uh, yellow. And now I will talk about the second tangent line, which corresponds to the other, freezing the other variable. So this is this responds to y equals b. And this responds to x equals a. 